I think Greg has introduced what I want to talk about really brilliantly. Uh, because he's, he's given you just a brilliant overview of the whole agronomy of maize and, and sorghum is not really in many ways a whole lot different. But I did want to talk about this G by E by M approach. And both Greg and David have, have really introduced that. And, and how we think and how we've been using crop models to, to address that. So rather than give you a, a package of tactical agronomy of sorghum or physiology of sorghum, I want to think ahead a little bit and say, well, what, what can we do in terms of what sort of sorghum crops do we need for where we're trying to grow them? What can we do differently to what we're doing now to make things better? And so there's a lot of um, modeling and simulation in here. There's a lot of people who have helped do this. And the focus is very much around water and abiotic stress. So um, it's the major, you know, you've got a dryland a dryland crop like sorghum. It's a major dominant limiting factor. Of course, there are many others. But I'm not going to go anywhere near nutrients, diseases, pests, near that. It's going to focus on water. <coughs> I want to cover six things. A little bit about um, specific adaptation and this G by E by N concept, because you've already had a fair bit of that. Sorghum in Australia, very quickly, because most of you will be very familiar with that. Um, but I do want to start to cover the notion of <coughs> Uh, production environment characterization because that will be a thread through here that I hope you will see by the end of it how important it is. And then the notion of simulating adaptation, so looking at um, what you might do with different genetics environments and management, and the notion of an adaptation landscape. Then the ways we approach that, broad adaptation where you might be trying to find plant breeding company might be trying to find what's the best genotype across all of this, given some standard management. So if I was just going to do one thing everywhere, what would I do? Then look at specific adaptation. How do I change that? And what often happens is uh, plant breeders will produce an elite hybrid or line, and agronomists will go and adapt its management. Um, so what is the best local management with the best geno general genotype? But what if you start to think about changing those things simultaneously, which we don't do too much of? That's maybe where we can make the next advance. So I want to look specifically at what's the value of specific adaptation for soil. And then come back to what this means and, and back to that thread around environment type and why that's so important. <coughs> so the notion of the adaptation landscape is just this. So this is from the discussions a long, long time ago with Mark Cooper, um, about the notion of thinking about um, these various possibilities. If you think of all the genotypes you could make, all the environments and management systems you can grow them in, there are squillions of them. And if you grow them, and if you think of each point on here as one of these combinations, and the vertical distance is the yield you get when you put that combination together, that gives you this sort of landscape. And what you're trying to do in crop improvement is find the peak, okay? But you don't quite know where you are and you don't know where you're going. And if you, next year, this whole landscape will change, particularly if you're in this sort of environment where you flip from El Nino's to El Nino's. So the whole thing is like an ocean floating around. You're trying to find these peaks and they're not even staying still. So how on earth do we get anywhere? So traditionally what we do is focus on broad adaptation. And that makes a lot of sense. You say, let's look at a whole lot of different genotypes, grow them in lots of places, find the best ones, cycle them around, cross them, find the best ones, do that. And you will get somewhere, slowly. And the same with management. If you're given that, this environment might be a little bit different, let's manage it a little bit differently. But can we do better than that? Is there a value proposition for specific adaptation by thinking about the things simultaneously rather than sequentially? Sorghum in Australia, second thing. Um, I think many of you know about sorghum, so I'll spend 10 seconds on this. Uh, you know where the northern grain spelt is, you know the sorts of rainfall you get, a couple of million tonnes, a bit less than a million hectares, and extremely high climatic variability. So you've got this notion of risk around water and the incidence of stress in the crop prevalent and a major factor in, in, the, in the summer crop. 
So the idea of environment characterization, what do we mean by that? The, the, the notion is, is to look at simulating the, the stress patterns through the life cycle of the crop. And there are a few people here who have done this in a number of crops, and you'll hear a bit more about it, I suspect, this afternoon from um, Corinne and Yash in, in wheat and, and legumes. But in sorghum, the, the idea is to look at, if I'm a sorghum crop, when do I feel stressed? In, in my life cycle, if I'm going through from planting, through to flowering, through to maturity, and the environment's changing around me, what time in that cycle am I getting a stress, or am I likely to get one? And how severe is it going to be? And so that's actually how a crop's experience it, experiencing its environment. It doesn't know about rainfall and temperature. It just knows about, it doesn't know too much. But it, it, where it is in its life cycle, and what sort of stress it's experiencing at any point in time. It doesn't know what the next point in time is going to be. But we can classify these environments. And this is where models come in. We can set up key locations through this production zone. We know a bit about the soils, their water holding properties. So David is useful sometimes. And, <laughs> and we've got a lot of climate data. So we can, and, we, and we've got reasonable models to do this with. So you can run simulations. And this, this is the thermal time. So if we think of crop age, this is just the time through the crop cycle in, in stages, and flowering is around about here. And so each of these black lines is this supply-demand ratio tells you, tells you how stressed the crop is. If this is one, the crop is not stressed. It's getting as much water as it wants. If it's, as it gets lower and lower, the crop is more stressed, and these are then the thousands of simulations you can do, and you can just cluster them. So you just use an algorithm to cluster the ones that are most like each other, and you get this sort of pattern. These are the patterns that are the averages of all of these traces that are individual years, individual crops, that are grouped together. So you can see there's still quite a bit of noise in here, and there are, I forget how many thousands of simulations in here. But we sort of said, well, let's look at the five key types of environment that we get, and this is right across the sorghum growing region in northeast Australia. So you have a, one environment type that has low stress a lot, and then they progressively get more severe terminal stresses, and one that gets relieved after flowering. So you can see these three and four are the very severe terminal stresses. One gets relieved, a late stress after flowering, a progressively increasing stress. So these are the types of stresses that we can characterize sorghum with just about anywhere. Well, anywhere that's growing in Australia, we can say it will likely experience a stress similar to one of these. We can, we can classify it into one of those five types. Now that might be a different year in a different place and so on. But we'll come back to this. And if you think about these, well, in different places, and we've got, this will change with genetics and management, but we can think, here's just three places. Central Queensland, Northern New South Wales, and on the Downs. And you can see the five types and how they change in frequency. So the Dolby sites tend to have more of these uh, lower stress environments, deeper soil, uh, a bit more favorable rainfall environment than the Northern New South Wales and Central Queensland ones, which tend to have more frequent terminal stress environments. So just where you are changes the frequencies around. But each year will be different as well. So how do we use a simulation to do anything about this? And what, what we do is look at, OK, let's take the genetics and management that, that Greg covered so well and say, um, if we put our physiological understanding of how those things work into a dynamic crop model, then we can simulate it. <coughs> I'm not going to tell you anything about the crop model. We've spent about 20 years building the bloody thing. And, and it's got a lot of that science in it, and, and, it's, and it works reasonably, reasonably well. I think we're fairly confident that we can do this stuff with some credibility. Certainly, probably a lot more credibility than we could have uh, when we first started. But you can look at things like management, row configuration, sort of skip row, or you know, single skip, double skip, or solid planting, density, the sort of things Greg talked about, 
You can play with maturity. You can play with tilling. You can play with root systems. So tilling is <coughs> an important one in sorghum that changes the whole canopy dynamic around root system architecture. Greg mentioned it in, in maize, but we also get quite significant differences in root system architecture in sorghum that can genetically change access to water at depth. The environments you're going to put this into, different locations, different soils. We've got good climate data uh, historically, and we hope we keep it here. Sowing date and water. <coughs> seeing water. So this is where interactions with your cropping system um, come into play, um, and various sowing dates you can use. So if you look at all that to get this sort of G by E by M, you can set up uh, computing of something like three million crops. Uh, there's no way on earth you can experiment with all those interactions, um, but you can simulate them. And now with the computing architecture available, you can simulate that many crops fairly quickly. It leaves you with a hell of a lot of data that you've got to try to unscramble. But fortunately, we've got people like Greg down the back there who can develop tools that enable us to look at this pretty easily. So what are some of these things? Management. If we look at row configuration, really what we're trying to do um, is just, it's a water saving strategy. So we have to do experiments, and here's Ian Broad a little while back, digging lots of holes in the rain out shelter at Hermitage, trying to figure out where do the sorghum roots go, how much water do they get out of this space, and then you can model it. So once you understand it and quantify it, you can model, model what would happen with um, solid and double skip systems. So this is soil water fraction, one fully wet, zero fully dry, days after sowing. And you can see the solid <coughs> system just uses water more rapidly in this terminal stress environment. Whereas the double skip one uses it more slowly, got less canopy, you've got this, it's got to grow roots into that space. So you just end up with a lot more water after flowering, it gives you a you know, a much better yield environment in this type of in this type of uh, environment type. Victor Sargas is here, found this out uh, 30 to 20 years ago, wrote a beautiful paper on sunflower patches. So same thing with density, um, and what you're really on about is manipulating um, transpiration and distribution in the crop cycle. So you're you're changing how much water the crop gets when by changing the canopy uh, architecture. Similarly, maturity and tillering, we know enough about how they work. So maturity, photo period, for example, will change the duration of a crop, and that duration will change the leaf number. So as soon as you change the leaf number, short, late maturing, more leaves, more wood use. Um, it doesn't have to be photo period. This can be just intrinsic maturity or temperature. Same with tillering. We know the dynamics of tillering and how it works. And there's genetic differences in tillering and in maturity. And what you're really doing is changing the architecture of the canopy and the dynamic with which it uses water and also nitrogen. But let's stick with water. You're changing the demand for water. So if you have a late maturity, high tillering thing, it's going to grow a big canopy. It's going to need a lot of water. It's going to run out quicker if it doesn't have enough. And this is just an example of a simulation of exactly that point. So here's your simulated yield against a standard. So a standard, let's just say a standard agronomy here, a medium maturing cultivar, five plants per meter square, 50,000 hectare, planted in uh, meter rows. And then you just compare the, the blue dots to that, and that's a sort of a high input strategy. So you go for a late maturing, high density uh, type, and you can see if you get a really high yielding year, that's going to give you a great kick up. If you get, get a poor year, it's going to crash. And with a low input strategy, same sort of maturity cultivar, lower density, but going out into skip rows, you do much better in these poor years, but you lose the advantage in the good year. So you've got this severe trade-off, classic G by E, of, um, of what's going on here. Um, this Low intensity strategy is very safe, but you're throwing away a lot of yield potential at, at this end. So what do we, how do we um, go about simulating this? If we, um, we can put all the environment attributes together, 
basically where I was saying before, we can simulate all these possibilities and start looking at these questions of broad adaptation or specific adaptation. And that's what I want to do from here on. We've done those few million simulations. Let's look at what genotype, what do we need in a genotype to give us broad adaptation across all those variable environments? And then what would happen? How do we change the management? And how do we, what, what possibilities are there for changing both things? So these are the sort of horrible pictures. Um, when you simulate a landscape, you get these sort of multi-dimensional pictures, but it's not <coughs> that difficult if I walk you through it. So if you just take one of these one of these boxes, okay, you've got tillering, high tillering, low tillering on the y-axis and across the x-axis, you've got maturity, early maturity to late. So each box is tillering versus maturity. And then in each column, you've got this is a double skip system, a single skip system, or a solid planted system, and each row is a different level of density. And then the heat map gives you the yield. So the blue is the high yield system. And this is a particular, just one year of a simulation. So we've simulated all these combinations of row configuration, density, maturity, and tillering. And then we go, right, what was really like in 2005 at Emerald was that. That high yield outcome is with low tillering, single skip, at a low density and, and relatively late maturity. And you think, okay, that's cool. But let's look at the next year. The next year, you have totally different. Your blue is down here. So suddenly you want late, high tillering, early maturity, high density, solid planting, and you can get the high yield. So it's a bit like that low intensity, high intensity strategy. So if you're a farmer sitting in these, this place two years in a row, what do you do? You, you know, do you, if you, you don't know what year you're going to get when you've got to make these decisions. And these are the differences that confront you. You're not going to know what's the best thing to do at the time you have to make the decision. So there's huge risks involved in making those decisions. So the risk component of this just can't be ignored. So when you're thinking about what's the best genetics over all of these environments, and let's take this from a plant breeder, sorghum breeder will go out there and grow a whole lot of uh, breeding trials, meter rows, 50,000 plants per hectare. Everything, at least I think they still do that. They used to. And, and then just try to find, and run that across a whole sample of environments and try and find what genotypes do the best. And that's fair enough. You, you know, with the amount of resources you've got, that's, that's what you can do. But what you then end up with is if you think about it, you get, um, if you run a whole lot of different genotypes across different environments at that maturity, at that management, we can simulate that and say, well, here's the yield you get. These are average yields, by the way. Each of these dots is, is 100 years of a particular <coughs> genotype in a particular environment. This is the average yield of that genotype over 100 years, and this is the failure risk. So this is what fraction of years don't I make a break-even crop? So how often am I going to make a loss? And so this is sort of where you get the notion of average yield versus risk and the trade-off between the two, and you've got to make some decision about where do you want to be on this frontier? The ones on the frontier are the ones you want, because they give you the highest yield at least risk. If, you, um, if you're in these grey dots, you can always find one that either gives you more yield at the same risk or um, less risk for the same yield. So you want to be on these, these genotypes here. So we've said let's put some arbitrary trade-off of risk in here and we'll take this genotype around here as the ones that we will, we will trade off our yield versus risk. And that's a very personal decision as to how risk averse you are. So the ones that come out best here are early to medium maturity, medium to high tillering, and the narrow root end. So that's our, our standard genotype across all of soil. That would give you a pretty good trade-off of yield and risk. So let's think about whether that's the best everywhere. If we then group 
the region into about six sub-regions, which we've just done sort of arbitrarily in a way. But you know, they geographically uh, sub-regions, eastern and western central Queensland, Downs, Southwest Downs, Liverpool Plains. So these are sort of main geographical locations for the Sorghum region. And then we do that same thing for, each, for the six of these. And so this is our, <coughs> and this is trying to find, we take that genotype that we found as the best one, and now we look at um, the global management. So we had five plants, solid, that's the red dot, okay? But what if we change the density or the row configuration? This is what we end up with in terms of average yield versus risk. So where would we be? So if we, if we just change the management in each place around that optimum genotype, here we don't change anything. <coughs> here we increase the density a bit because we can actually get a bit more yield without too much risk. <coughs> Down here we do the opposite. We reduce the density and go out to single skip because we can reduce the risk enormously without changing the yield too much. So this is what an agronomist would normally do get the best hybrid that's come out and adapt it to the local area and say, right, in this part of the world, if you're in the southwest downs or western downs, you probably should start looking at lower density single skip systems with that type of genetic material. <coughs> but what if we could say, um, what genotype might you change to in that region? Not just change the management on the best genotype, change the genotype as well. So what's the best? combination of G by M for that region. And you do the same thing. You get the frontier of average yield against risk and what changes. So we're going from the pink dot we started off with to the green triangle, which is if we just change the management. And now we're going to the blue dot, which would be where you would end up if you um, change both genetics and management simultaneously which you can do in the virtual world because you can run those few million simulations and, and play with them. So mostly in these, um, in these areas that have the high yielding environments, you tend to go for this later maturing or you know, higher increase your canopy. And so you bring in um, maturity or tilling. Um, in, in these environments, you know, you tend to other, most other environments, what you do <coughs> is take off the tillering and increase your density a bit. Remember down here, you've already gone to skip row, okay? So this is after you've gone and changed your management. What do I do to change the genotype? And you can get significant advantages in yield by just reducing your tillering and increasing your density. So you're changing, you're trading off a genetic factor and a management factor. And so we've been arguing for a while about this concept of reducing tilling in some of these skip rate systems. There's probably a significant way to get advance in these more marginal cropping environments for silver. So the, the interesting point to bring this back to environment types is that this is really underpinned by the mix of environment types you get in those regions. Now remember the environment types, we had five of them and they were different in how the crop felt stressed through its life cycle. Apologies for the horrible colours, but um, these are the frequencies of those environments from one to five in the different regions. And you can sort of see that if you go, just the, the contrast I've highlighted from Darling Downs east to west, you just increase the frequency enormously of these more terminal stress environments, and that really underpins why you're moving these strategies around, why you, why you want different combinations of genetics and management in here as to what you do in here. And that's fine, but the problem is it's also restrictive because we, we still get some high environments, some low stress environments in here, and we still get some very severe ones in here. So you're not sure ahead of time what you're getting. And, if, and that's highlighted by this. If we just look at um, the central Queensland example. This graph, it shows a difference in yield 
from a standard. Okay, so this is in the middle is the standard. This is yield difference against the yield of the standard. So the yield of the standard obviously has no difference. And you have either early maturing, medium or late, high tillering, medium tillering, low tillering. And what, the thing I've highlighted is if you go to, um, when you have a late high tillering type, you get significant advantage, yield advantage over the standard in the orange dots, which are environment type one, the low, low stress environment. But you have significant advantage of your early low tillering types in environment types uh, four and five, which are your more terminal stress environment. So you've got this trade-off. Um, you still, even though in a region you say it's got more of these types of environments, so I would move this way or I would move that way, you still, you're still not, you not going to get it exactly right because you don't know in each year which environment type you're going to get. So the, the significant opportunity is if you've got a better advanced indicator of the environment type than just where you are. So if you, if you know where you are, so that gives you some advantage because your environment type mix will be different if you're in Emerald, or in Dolby, or in Moree. But it may, may be a whole lot better if you, if you know more than that. So the implications of this is that we can increase yield and reduce risk with specific adaptation. We can do that now. All of these things contribute. The value varies among the sub-regions, and that depends on the mix of environment types that you're confronted with. If you could predict what environment type you were going into, then you could really do something a hell of a lot better. So we're, rather than doing a prediction of rainfall, we're starting to look seriously at how do you predict that environment type. That's what crop really needs to know. And there are ways that can give you some indicators of that. Clearly, the amount of soil water you've got at sowing, which is one of the indicators that's been around for a long time, shifts your frequency of environment types that you're about to go into. So does your sowing time, so does ENSO. And I've put all these pictures up here because I'm worried. This is this year. Here's the European model for SST anomalies, and it's going to this highly positive event coming up. Here's the actual SSTs anomalies last month. Big hot tongue out here near South America. Fortunately, still got this hot area up here. SOI is sort of hanging in, but if this happens, this will go negative. Our rainfall probabilities will look like that, and our envir environment type frequency distribution will shift out to threes, fours, and fives. Okay? For this wet season and this autumn season. So, watch that space. Thanks, Brian.